I quit. <laughs> oh, Christmas has just lasted too long into January. And no, not really. I, I quit. There's, there's a certain seduction in the phrase, isn't there? I feel like there's a sense of, of power reclaimed, suppressed life reemerging in the face of untenable circumstances. I quit. It's this release that makes the eruption so satisfying to watch in a movie or a TV show. To take all that's been stuffed down and bottled up and let it explode in one grand gesture of self-proclamation, self-reclamation. And apparently it's quite in vogue these days. Do you know anyone personally who, who's been part of this great resignation, so-called great resignation, a few of you? You can chat about it on, on, on Zoom if, you've, if you're so moved. When I, when I taught uh, conflict resolution with fourth and fifth graders, we used to talk about it like shaking up a soda can, all that bottling up inside, stuffing down the feelings and, and not talking about them, not dealing with them, talking about it with other people, but not the one you really need to talk about it with, like shaking up a soda can. And of course, we know what eventually happens. <laughs> and that, that moment of release, and not unsimilar, although I think in a more thoughtful way, John described it earlier, moment of release. I quit. It's so seductive because we know something about its necessity. We've all had moments in our lives where we've felt a buildup of one kind or another, felt ourselves trapped in circumstances which in some essential way we couldn't tolerate. The cost of, of continuing to comply, to staying in the role, the job, the relationship, the dynamic, the cost of continuing might show up in a, an uneasy feeling in the gut or a tightening in the throat or clenching in the jaw, the weight of pressure on the shoulders. It could be racing thoughts that grasp at the attention the moment you wake, or a rage that has to be kept in check when you see your boss or coworker or whoever it is, or a helpless collapse in the face of your children's choices. Whatever our buildups look like. We know when we are in them that our, our beings, our hearts, our bodies, our spirits cannot endure that pressure endlessly and that one way or another, sooner or later, there will have to be a release. Do you know what I'm talking about? Yeah. We watched uh, the new Disney movie recently. Has anyone else seen Encanto, it's called? I, I can't you know, recommend it highly enough, especially if you have a six-year-old to watch it with. But uh, we've been listening to the music nonstop ever since. Beautiful music by Lin-Manuel Miranda. So that's, you know, worth it for that. And it's, it's the first movie that Henry's really gotten into like this. Just wants to hear the music constantly. It's about the family Madrigal. And each member of the family takes an archetypal role one of the archetypal roles that people play in our families, in our family systems. There's a wise matriarch who holds the reins as well as the pain of an old family trauma. There's the one who hears everything. There's the one who's beautiful and perfect. There's the one that no one speaks about. The one who takes care of others, healing their wounds with baked goods. And there's the strong one who does all the work without complaint. Louisa is her name. I want to share a few lyrics from her song. I'm the strong one. I'm not nervous. I'm as tough as the crust of the earth is. I move mountains. I move churches. And I glow because I know what my worth is. I don't ask how hard the work is, but uh, got a rough, indestructible surface. But under the surface, I feel berserk as a tightrope walker in a three-ring circus. Under the surface, was Hercules ever like, yo, I don't want to fight Cerberus? 
under the surface, I'm pretty sure I'm worthless if I can't be of service. Hmm. Under the surface, I'm pretty sure I'm worthless if I can't be of service. But wait, if I could shake the crushing weight of expectations, would that free some room for joy or relaxation or simple pleasure? Instead, we measure this growing pressure, keeps growing, keeps going, because all we know is pressure, like a drip, drip, drip that'll never stop. Pressure that'll tip, tip, tip till you just go pop. Oh, I can relate. <laughs> Louisa. <laughs> One of the central questions of the film is how does a family stay together? How do people keep on loving and living if they are released from the constrictions of their roles? How does a family stay connected if people are released from the constrictions of their roles? How do we quit and keep connected? I think living with intention, this theme we're talking about this month, requires actually a lot of quitting. We can't live the life we intend if the life of shoulds and musts is constantly demanding our time and our energy. To live intentionally requires us to quit anything with which we can't align ourselves with integrity and even enthusiasm, high bar though that may seem. So I've never been much of a gardener, but my, my sweetie is an avid gardener, so I'm learning. And one of the, the lessons that struck me recently is the way that gardeners encourage root growth. Now for perennial plants, I'm understanding, this is just a part of the annual cycle. In the fall or the winter, the plant quits, quits its upward growth. All the effort it's been putting into flowering, it quits, exhausted by all that pressure and responsibility. And then the gardener, caring for these exhausted little beings, might trim even further the upward growth back, bring the stalks back dramatically even to encourage the plant to focus on its root system. And if you're transplanting something, taking it out of the place it's accustomed to, making it adapt to new circumstances, then it really needs to focus on its roots. So you make sure to cut it back severely, cut off all of its flowers, to help it know to, to quit putting energy into its outward visible life so it will focus on its roots and in the end will be able to flower more in the spring. And I don't know about you, but I, I certainly have a sense of getting transplanted in a big way these past couple of years. Apparently last week, the Tampa Bay Buccaneers wide receiver, Antonio Brown, added his name to the roster of the Great Resignation, dramatically quitting the team in the middle of the game, <laughs> ripping his shoulder pads off, throwing his shirt into the stands before giving the crowd the peace sign and departing into the visitor's locker room. I, I didn't find this out because I assiduously follow the NFL, but from one of the folks who I go to for, for mentorship and consulting, Reverend Jake Morrill, he shared it in, a, in an article he recently put out titled, Seven Questions for the Thoughtful Quitter. So this is the question, how if we're gonna need to do some quitting in order to live intentionally, if we're gonna need to do some quitting in order to live intentionally, how are we going to quit with the same quality of intention that we want for our whole lives? How do we quit thoughtfully, purposefully, perhaps most importantly in a way that doesn't set us up to get right back into the same pattern the next circumstances that we find ourselves in? Because if all we're able to do is throw up our hands and storm off, blaming others for why it all went wrong, while we might enjoy the, the immediate moment, the burst of adrenaline, it's likely that we will end up in a similar trap soon enough. Jake described this as a, a question of maturation. He said, when I was in my 20s, I once walked off a job site at the mid-morning coffee break. 
I couldn't figure out how to else to extricate myself from a suffocating situation. Couldn't figure out how else to do it. Alternatively, he says, in my 20s, I stayed in a romantic relationship long after I knew I wanted out because I could not figure out how to leave without causing great upset in my partner and myself. And the prospect of that upset was more powerful for me than the clarity and freedom for us both to be in a relationship we each deserve to be in. I regret, he says, both of those actions, and I also see them with some compassion as examples of my lower maturity earlier in my adulthood. In your life, you may also remember times when you abruptly stormed off or else hung in too long. I certainly can recall several examples of either one. And so he offers these, these questions to reflect on our quitting. Does it look like a long period of quiet compliance broken by defiantly storming off, giving the finger to whatever or whoever you're quitting? Or does it look like clarity within yourself about what you will and you won't do, about what principles you're going to live by as you pursue your goals and the person you're aiming to become? Does it look like blaming the other, the other person, the job, Mark Zuckerberg, or cigarette companies for how you've behaved? Or does it look like adopting a fairly objective view of a complex dynamic and seeing your responsibility for your part in things, the way, for instance, you've sought and gained rewards from something you now deem intolerable? This, I think, is the painful truth that rings out in Luisa's song, I'm pretty sure I'm worthless if I can't be of service. The truth that we have likely played a role, clung to the benefits of status, identity, money, security, comfort, whatever it is, clung to the benefits we find for ourselves in the situation that we would now like to escape. It's a painful truth but it is ultimately liberating. The great Sufi teacher Mevlana Rumi taught, the cure for the pain is the pain. The cure for the pain is the pain. To be guided by this pain into seeing ourselves more clearly, into seeing our own needs and desires, our own motivations that kept us playing a role we now want to quit, is to begin to be liberated from the pain. When we see clearly the reasons that we've chosen to participate in a situation that no longer works for us, we are able to bring deeper intention to our quitting and how we go on living. What if Antonio Brown had been able at some point, Jake wonders, to sit down with Tampa Bay Buccaneers coach Bruce Arians and say, coach, I've been thinking Here's what's important to me. Here's how I understand my part in this team. Toward that end, here's what I'm willing to do. Here's what I'm not willing to do. Here's my request for you and our partnership. And he says to, that, to, the, to the command and control mindset, that kind of dialogue seems absurd and impossible. He says, as the kids say there in, in, in East Tennessee, we say it a little differently here, you get what you get and you don't throw a fit. In other words, suck it up or just quit. But a more mature mindset understands that each of us is responsible for our behavior, for conveying our principles clearly to others, above all through our actions, and for accepting the consequences that come from our clarity. Anyone can storm off, slam the door, and just quit. Maturity looks like knowing where you're headed in life, what you're trying to become, what it will take to get there. And then having the courage and the resolve to be doggedly about that clarity every day, including in important relationships. The courage and resolve to be doggedly about that clarity. I've been growing more and more aware of how I need to protect my attention 
if I'm going to be doggedly about where I'm headed in life, what I'm trying to become. I need to protect my attention because it's so much easier, actually, to spend my days reacting and responding to the latest news, the needs and agendas of others, the anxious situation of the moment, easier to allow my attention to be swept up in whatever happens to be presenting itself as urgent and important that day than to have to keep figuring out and doggedly pursuing my own inner sense of what I'm about. So I'm, I'm working on, on quitting quitting my conversation with the world about the latest urgent everything. I'm working on quitting knowing that I'm lovable by being more available and responsive than I really want to be. I'm working on giving up the sense of pride and identity that I've built like Luisa Madrigal of being the strong one. So here's a, a scary one to say out loud. I noticed that if I'm going to be dedicated to what matters most to me, it's time I started quitting the COVID conversation. And it's tempting, I admit, to throw up my hands and declare flat out, I quit the COVID conversation. I'm just done talking about it. I'm done. But that's, that's not really what I want, not what I mean. Instead, I'm... I'm working to be clear for myself about what I will and I won't do, what principles I'm living by, to make decisions that I feel good about for myself and my family, to follow all the public health guidance to care for my wider community. I'm so grateful to live in a, a place where I trust the public health officials to make responsible policy decisions. To refuse to make decisions for others about what's healthy or safe for them. To listen and hear the impact the virus and all our scrambling to deal with it is having on my community. And to let go of living in a constant state of vigilance to turn off the emergency mode setting on my own nervous system, that setting that shuts down deep thinking and farsighted vision. To get where you want to go in life in 2022, Jake admonished, felt like me personally, you're going to need to quit at least 10 things. It might be a habit like doom scrolling or overeating. It might be a relationship, that friendship with the person who talks only about themselves. It might be a mindset filled with grievance and resentment. It's important to rigorously and continuously review your commitments. It's important to take stock of what you need to quit. But as you weed the garden of your life, removing habits and conditions that no longer serve who you are becoming, take the opportunity to notice how you quit. As you cut back the flowers and stalks to allow the roots to grow as deep and wide as they need, Take the opportunity to notice how, how you quit. And so here they are, the, the seven questions for the thoughtful clear. Are you clear about your goals for your life? Are you clear about your, your guiding non-negotiable principles? In the given situation, are you clear about what you will do and what you won't do? In the given situation, are you clear about what you will tolerate and what you won't tolerate? In the given situation, have you articulated your position and listened for the response? other than, I love this one, other than keeping things as they are or quitting, are you aware of at least five other choices you could make? Are you aware of what you'll practice, experiment with, or learn in the process of engaging this difficult choice?
you know, here's what I believe to be truer than I'm worthless if I can't be of service. If I live my life with deep integrity and intention, if I pursue my own aliveness with clarity and purpose and rigor, it will serve the world more than any self-sacrificing labor of martyrdom ever could. Howard Thurman says, don't ask yourself what the world needs, ask yourself what makes you come alive, because what the world needs is more people who've come alive. If each of us goes about living and quitting with that depth of intention, we will become the strong fibers needed to weave this tapestry of love we call community, to weave that beloved community we long to see in the world. So may we quit each of us, those patterns and behaviors that no longer serve who we are becoming. May our quitting be led by the forming edge of our adult maturity in service of our deepest selves, our truest callings, our holy aliveness. May our quitting be in service to being strong, self-connected citizens of a country and a world that needs people who are living lives with clarity and integrity. And may we trust that as we come more and more alive, as we quit and stay connected, we are becoming who we were always meant to be. May it be so, and amen. <laughs>